Dear all, thank you for being here today. I would like to welcome you to our webinar about restarting travel and tourism after the COVID-19 pandemic. As uh, we all know, we are uh, still going through a critical period. The pandemic is still here. We are already experiencing uh, the second wave and it seems 2021 will be another difficult year. So we have to deal not only with uh, the ongoing health crisis, but with the economic and social crisis that follow. And we must remain alert until we have effective vaccine or cure so we can again move and travel with safety. Dear friends, Travel and tourism have been hit very hard and we have tried to take measures, but they are non-common, uniform, non-common and uh, not enough. The European Commission issued guidelines and recommendations for protocols across borders for safe travel, but still, we are far from coordinated approach between all <clears throat> member states. Also, the European Parliament drafted and voted a resolution for tourism last June to support businesses, especially SMEs, for their survival, to protect millions of jobs for, from uh, being lost, and to resume travel with safety with mandatory tests upon departure. More must be done globally as well, uh, and now is the time to take action from the lessons learned so far from this crisis, to come up with solutions, to implement best practices and to coordinate better because we need to have common rules and protocols across the world. Also, it is very important to think about the next day and remain on track on our long-term commitments and goals for sustainable development. Um, you are all leaders in your field and experts in overcoming challenges. So we value very much the views and uh, proposals you will present today for protecting and resuming travel and tourism. Just a few more words about how we will proceed. Um, we will first hear from all our speakers uh, and right after, we will come back with shorter statements and uh, comments to talk a bit more about issues that uh, were brought up. Um, finally, I would like to point out that we are live on Zoom and Facebook platforms, and I want to thank everyone who has joined to watch. Um, please, when we don't speak, uh, uh, keep uh, uh, mute so we don't hear different noises. Um, we begin with a video message from one of the leaders of the global travel industry, Gloria Guevara, CEO and President of the World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC. I had the pleasure of having collaborated with Gloria during my previous term as Minister of Tourism of Greece, and I had much respect for WTTC's work all these years, and especially throughout this crisis. Let's hear what her message is about the latest developments and priorities for restarting travel and tourism. Good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for inviting WTTC to this very important international conference. I'm delighted to be here. Greetings from London. But before that I start and bring a global perspective, I want to thank especially the organizers, uh, which is very important to bring everyone together during this difficult uh, situation so that we can overcome the challenge together and at the same time to recover. Let me walk you to the global view and our global data. But before I do that, I would like just to share who we are. WTTC, as you know, represents the global private sector. A little bit over 200 CEOs from around the world are our members. We represent all industries from airlines, airports, hotels, OTAs, travel companies, all industries around the world. Currently, our chairman is Chris Nasetta, CEO of Hilton Worldwide, 
our vice chair for China, Jane Sun from 3.com. And we have vice chairs in all the regions, including, of course, North America with Cardinal Corporation, with Arnold Donald and many others. Now let me tell you a little bit about the numbers and the global view. For 30 years, WTTC has done a lot of research. We have done economic impact research in 185 countries around the world. And that's how we know that we contribute to 10% of the global GDP. As you will see here, 10%, that was a contribution from last year. And while the economy grew 2.5 average globally, the growth of travel and tourism GDP was 3.5. In the chart below, the gray line shows the economy, the growth in the world in the last nine years, and the green line shows travel and tourism GDP. For nine years, we have outpaced the growth of the economy, as you will see there. 330 million jobs around the world, or one in 10, were our contribution in 2019. And all the jobs created from around the world in all the industries and all the sectors, new jobs in the last five years, in every single year, one in four new jobs were contributed by travel and tourism, which is amazing. Now, moving on on the impact of travel and tourism globally, as we are living an unprecedented time, let me share with you the data, the data we just released. Unfortunately, as of now, 142 million people have been impacted. Yes, 142 million jobs have been lost globally. And by the end of the year, this number is going to be 174. Our previous forecast say that by the end of the year, we were going to reach a number higher than 190, which was 191 million jobs. And the good news is that this number has decreased to 174. One of the reasons is because a couple of countries have recovered domestic, such as China. That is impressive how domestic has been recovering. And other countries around the world also have been recovering domestic in Germany, France, Greece, and, and many others. And that has helped us to reduce the loss of jobs. It is very important to learn from the past. And let me highlight three lessons that we at WTTC have analyzed with 90 different situations in the last 20 years. Let me get your attention in the top left graph, please. In the top left graph, you have the world, the last 20 years. The white line is the economy, the global economy. The green line is GDP for travel and tourism. The blue bars are jobs. As you will see there, there were two situations where the global economy was impacted. One was 9-11, that's the top left. And then the other one was the financial crisis. In those situations, there was a significant impact to travel and tourism. However, the reaction was different and the recovery was different. As you will see on the left, the recovery was in a U-shaped form. It took us years to recover and it was very painful. Then in the financial crisis in 2008, it was a pretty fast recovery in 18 months because we had a coordinated approach, public and private collaboration was key, and that allowed us to recover in 18 months. Now, let me get your attention to the top right. That's the G20. Whatever happens in the G20 has a direct impact in the world. Let me highlight the last lesson learned, which is the bottom right. That's China. It's the last 20 years of the economy in China. Unbelievable. The white line, as I say, is the economy, the green line is travel and tourism. Look what happened in 2003. That's the outbreak of SARS. And look at how that was a V-shaped recovery. That was very impressive because we didn't have a vaccine. And despite that we didn't have a vaccine, they were able to recover pretty fast because they were able to isolate the people infected and have the right protocols in place. And that tells us that we can recover from this outbreak if we do the right thing if we work together, public and private, and also if we implement the right protocols and the standard. That's why in the G20 platform, it is crucial to get aligned. And on October 7, we made history. When we had for the first time ever, the private sector involved in the ministerial meeting that happened and hosted by Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia also, as the chair of the G20, asked us, asked WTTC and the private sector to put together a plan to bring back 100 million jobs. This plan includes 12 commitments from the private sector, and it also includes some needs that we need from governments. Very important to move from just trying to contain the spread, to contain the spread, and also to try to coexist with the virus in a safe way. It is crucial, very important to resume international travel. And for that, we have to work together. 
a coordinated approach to reopen borders is very important. We need to implement an international testing protocol so that next time that I travel, I can have a test on departure. And if that test is negative, I can board a plane. And then when I arrive in my destination, I don't need quarantine because I am COVID free. That's why testing is very important in departure to avoid exporting the virus. Thanks again for having me. Looking forward to working with you. It is very important to continue having events like the one that you're having today so that we can recover faster and we can bring back the millions of livelihoods that have been impacted. Thank you. Um, we thank uh, Gloria Guevara for her very important intervention. WTTC estimates that more than uh, 174 million jobs to be lost by the end of this year. This is a truly shocking number, but there is still very good reason to believe uh, that there is hope for recovery if we learn to coexist with the virus with safety. And for travel, Testing upon depart departure is the key, as Gloria also pointed out. Now I welcome our first speaker, Ambassador Do Yang Sim. Thank you for accepting my invitation. It's an honor to have you with us from your current uh, position, among others, as the chair of the UN Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Alumni and all your previous effective work on sustainable tourism and on the elimination of uh, poverty that brought change to many people's lives. You represent an excellent role model for all. You have been leading efforts to battle some uh, very serious crises in the past and we are looking forward to your valuable in, insight on this current crisis and beyond. Thank you, Elena. It is great pleasure to be part of this um, important Ebina, and uh, I, it was great to hear uh, from Gloria what WTTC has been uh, doing. And I like to compliment WTTC in a way that they really try to approach different country and all different political aisle, make sure that, you know, this, uh, the, the, the way we recover from this epidemic is considered effort. It doesn't matter which political party you are. So I think she tried to approach not only ruling party, but opposition party. And I, I saw a very good response from Korean uh, political parties, political sectors, as well as uh, governments. So I would like to compliment her. Uh, it's great to see a lady working very hard. I believe in lady working very hard. Having said that, let me start, uh, you know, by saying uh, Korea's case very briefly. I know the whole world media has been uh, applauded the way Korea was able to uh, manage this epidemic. You know, at the very beginning when it broke out, we were the worst case because we were just next to China. We didn't have any boundary um, uh, lockdown. But somehow, without cl completely closing down our country, uh, we were managed to stay where we are. And I think it uh, is a very important thing is when government said, this is the situation, we trusted what government said. And we followed what government suggested. Look, there is there's no one, whether you're rich or powerful, poor or literate, whoever, no one is safe from this uh, corona epidemic. And we have to work together. We understood what that meant because 2015, when this MERS situation in Korea, we were lost, you know, that we are very confused, but we learned it very hard way that uh, the, it reminded us what happened to uh, MERS situation. So we said, okay, we're going to follow what government says. So, and then government uh, laid out very plainly in simple language. Okay, we are going to test everybody who comes in and who moves, uh, leave, uh, who comes in our border. And whoever doesn't feel good, uh, something not feeling good that we are going to give tests, it's going to be free, free of charge. And then we are going to trace anybody 
who might have possibility of contacting people with positive signs. We're going to trace you. And, you know, when we did that, we had a thorough, thorough tracing and some Western media raised an issue. Well, you know, what about privacy? What about, you know, the private information? What about this? And we said, no, that comes next to after we overcome this uh, epidemic situation. And then thirdly, I think we had a very well prepared treatment center. And we had, so we called it 3T, test, tracing and treatment. And that's what government said, we're gonna do this best. We're gonna put extra uh, budget and we're gonna take care of you. But please take care of this on your part. That's what government appeal does. Please wash your hands. I don't care where you are, just wash your hands. And if you cannot wash your hands, we have a sanitizer all over the country. Just put the sanitizer and wash. And then please wear a mask. Please, please, please wear a mask. And wearing mask was not a difficult exercise because, because I'm sorry to say this, we had all this yellow dust coming from China, industrialization. We're used to wearing masks in the wintertime, especially. So we said, no problem. And then please keep social distance. Please keep two meters between you and next person. And when you go into the elevator, they said no more than four people in the elevator. And when you are in the elevator, do not speak. Just keep your mouth closed. Don't say that. And you know, you know, so it was like a government and citizens partnership. And it wasn't hard for us to accept because at the end of the day, if I get sick. It's going to hurt the, the, the largest victim, biggest victim is going to be my family, my own grandchildren, my own children. So it was not easy. And, you know, like Ellen and I was talking to you a little earlier before we start this um, webinar. And I said, you know, uh, we are in a way, you know, when we look at from our end, when we see these big countries like OECD countries, uh, G7 countries, they're the wealthiest countries around the world. But look at the number of positives every day. It's just different, you know, uh, numbers. We are worried today, yesterday, we had, we were so country got upset because we have 200 positives. But when we see other news, like you know, hundred thousands, you know? So he said, how does it happen that way? And I, as I told you, what, and I, is, I think is there's some, a difference in uh, way of our lives, okay? Like in Korea, China and Japan, we shaking hands, especially between women and men are very new and we don't hug. And you hug, you kiss the ball, you know, cheeks two, two three times. And, uh, you, know, it just, you know, we like to, you go like this a lot of in you know, Thailand, but if you look at the countries with their way of living is, you know, shaking hands, instead of this, I mean, this instead of shaking hands, you see our numbers is down. You know, like uh, Mario was telling me, Thailand did a zero yesterday, zero positive yesterday. It happened that way. And then, you know, I was telling, I when I go to overseas, I see that in your way of life, you don't, see, you don't draw a line between What's inside of house, what's outside? You walk and then you, you wear same shoes and you go to even your bedroom. And it just happened that, that way. So I think if it's about time for us to you know, think of, is there any way we can change uh, the way of you know, association, way of socializing with people? I think that will you know, uh, take care of many, many things. So at the end of the day, I was, you know, yesterday I had a long talk with the president of Qatar, who is in charge of agency. Yes, losing jobs is awful right now. It's hitting. The companies are closing down. They send their you know, employees with, with no pay. And, but you know, government is subsidizing, but there's a limit how much you can do with taxpayers' money. So it's about time, you know, that everybody is really, truly worried. So how are we gonna do this traveling, resume traveling? So we look at you, uh, Elena, European Union Parliament, you are in a cluster of big countries, rather wealthy countries of the world, 
and smart people. And we are hoping that you will come up with something, uh, you know, even before the, this vaccine. That's what I want to say. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Do, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And you described really the best uh, practices from Korea that uh, they're remarkable and very important for uh, the rest of the world. A smooth partnership, I will keep that, between citizens and the state, build on trust, is also a key, as you pointed out. And also the three T, test, trace, and treatment. But to be honest, I don't know if we can change our mentality and stop hanging and kissing because <laughs> <laughs> this is really a way of expressing feelings um, um, in most parts of the world. So I hope we, cannot, we can keep it and we cannot lose it. But definitely right now we have this pandemic, we have to keep distances, we have to uh, sanitize, uh, I understand, and wear also the mask. Um, next, I would like um, to welcome uh, the Honorable Minister of Jamaica, Edmund Balt uh, Bartlett, uh, to share with us uh, his valuable input. I must note his excellent work in tourism and global resilience as a minister, but also as a founder of the co-chair of the board of the Global Tourism Resilience and Crisis Management Center. And I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate him for being the longest serving cabinet minister in the executive <laughs> of this country and the first to be appointed tourism minister three times. He has been awarded several times and recently was given the prestigious uh, Goosey Peace Prize from the Goosey Foundation of Philippines. Edmund, please share with us uh, your insights. Thank you very much, Elena, and um, a very warm good morning from the Caribbean and Jamaica, and certainly good afternoon to all who are in Europe and elsewhere. I thank you for the opportunity of sharing and um, to be with the very eminent panelists that to put together this morning, in my case, afternoon for you. Uh, Gloria was very, very effective earlier, and she left several wonderful nuggets for us to consider, uh, some of which no doubt will come out in, in the comments that I will be making. Um, and I'm sure will permeate much of what we have to say this morning. Uh, but you, Ellen, I want to thank for your continued and steadfast advocacy of tourism. Uh, I'm, I have great memories of you being minister in Greece and the interactions we've had in many global spaces. But now that you're the EU, your sphere of influence has even expanded. And I'm very pleased to see that you're taking this leading role in ensuring thought leadership and to guide us as we all seek to navigate this very difficult and treacherous sea called COVID-19. Um, here in Jamaica, of course, we like you have been very impacted, uh, but we don't today more than ever, uh, Elena, the world has become more vulnerable to extreme climate events, natural disasters, external shocks, terrorism, cybercrime, and pandemics. This vulnerability has increased due to the hyperconnectivity created through the sheer volume, speed, and reach of travel. And there has been no better example of this vulnerability than the impact of COVID-19. In March of this year, when the news broke of a viral outbreak in China, very few of us could have predicted that seven months after, this novel virus would have spread the world and become the most consequential global health crisis in our lifetimes. Over this period, all segments of the global economy have been eviscerated as global populations have been forced to adjust to the new normal of restrictions on public assembly, social distancing measures, national lockdowns, daily curfews, work from home orders, quarantines and stay at home orders. The effect of the pandemic on global travel and tourism has naturally been catastrophic as most countries were forced to close borders for months. And some borders are still closed even now and we don't know how long they will be for bringing international tourism to almost a complete halt. 
The impact of the pandemic has been disproportionate for us in the Caribbean and here in Jamaica, uh, which you know we are among the most tourism dependent region. Indeed, the Caribbean is regarded as the most tourism dependent region on earth. The pandemic has spurred rising unemployment, huge GDP losses for us, steep declines in foreign exchange, and has stymied other sectors that have traditionally established vital linkages with tourism, including agriculture, cultural and creative industries, manufacturing, tours, and attractions. So given the devastating impact of the pandemic, data suggests that pre-COVID buoyancy will only return to the tourism sector after 2023. It is clear then that we as global industry leaders and policymakers will need to begin the process of rethinking the future now. And I think this is one of the basis of this discussion uh, today. It is for that reason then that Jamaica, we quickly launched a recovery task force and we developed the following. One, a realistic view of the sector's baseline or starting position and scenarios for multiple versions of the future. We sort of do iterations in our mind as to what the future could be and what it would look like. Uh, we did a realistic view of the sector's baseline starting position and scenarios, uh, as I said, for multiple versions of the future. We, we did a strategic posture for the sector, as well as a broad direction of the journey back to growth. We established in that process a, what we call a TRT, that is the Tourism uh, Recovery Task Force. Um, and uh, then we, we, we looked at trigger points to tackle actions, which include a planned vision in a world that is learning to evolve rapidly. So those four key points represented the scenario that guided our thinking, which I will talk about a little bit now. So as devastating as the pandemic has been, the reality is that it is unlikely to be the last of this magnitude. A range of threats, including climate change and global warming impacts, cyber crimes and epidemics and pandemics are expected to continue to pose disruptive challenge to global tourism in the future. It is this very vulnerability, and history has shown, with the disruptions such as SARS, and we heard about that, global economic meltdown and 9-11, we heard about them. So as a matter of priority then, destinations globally will be required to pay historic attention to resilience building. The sector needs to become more adaptable, resilient, and agile. Uh, this pandemic has presented us with a unique opportunity to transition towards a greener and more balanced tourism, as it is anticipated that more international tourists will opt for sustainable destinations in the post-COVID era. With crisis, Elena, comes the need for adaptability and agility. Destinations that fall uh, outside of this and fail to reorient themselves towards greater sustainability are likely to be left behind. So more tourism products then will have to be built around health, wellness, and the green economy, emphasizing sustainable behaviors and practices by all involved in the tourism value chain, from the hotels and other enterprises to the local communities. We must promote tourism models that guarantee that the natural and cultural assets are valued and protected, and the intangible cultural heritage of local communities that encourage the flourishing of creativity is safeguarded. It calls for a more resilient model of tourism that are in harmony with the environment, safeguard livelihoods, and from which local communities benefit. The concepts of destination security this is an important point that I will perhaps develop on a little later in the discussion. And attractiveness in the post-COVID era will increasingly emphasize health and safety standards. Traditional laser fair tourism that has played into the demand for carefree socializing, and I suppose we heard a little bit about that from Madame Doe, <laughs> uh, and experiences will be increasingly substituted by new tourism models that balance health and safety requirements with fun and recreation. 
That will be a challenge for us in the West here, Elena, as we are regarded as the huggy, kissy, uh, touchy, feely group right? <laughs> of the world. So to achieve this equilibrium, we expect to see more hotels, cruise ships, restaurants, and tour operators upgrade their hygiene and sanitation facilities. We expect also to see the revamping of public spaces to allow for physical distances, the installation of barriers, and move towards touchless economy, um, technology, temperature screening. While incapable of identifying asymptomatic travelers, we think it, um, this temperature screening, as you mentioned earlier, is likely to become normalized. Cruise ships will plan to likely include temperature checks and medical screenings. Guests should also be expected to, be more, to see more frequent cleaning, transparent shields, abundant hand sanitizers, and reminders about distancing and reconfiguration of lobbies to create more space. Uh, I just to indicate that the parliament that I lead now, we just reconfigure the entire parliament to ensure that there is that uh, social distancing. It's, it's, it's quite a sight to see with um, sneeze, mom, screens, and all those sort of things included. So already here in Jamaica, tourism entities are being guided by a robust COVID-19 set of protocols that are developed in the early stages of the pandemic. These protocols, along with the establishment of innovative resilience corridors, this is a very important development, has allowed for greater peace of mind and safety of visitors and local alike. And just to indicate to you that since we have established the resilient corridor uh, four months ago, we've not had a single incident of infection in the corridor, even by for visitors who come or the workers of the industry. So the accelerated pace of digitalization since the pandemic also provides us with an opportunity to harness the potential of virtual technologies to develop new tourism products. So rapid um, digitalization coupled with emerging technologies such as virtual and augmented realities can create new forms of cultural experiences, dissemination, and new business models with market potential. Many tourism products can be marketed to international tourists virtually in a healthy, safe, and affordable manner. We just had a historic uh, trade show uh, involving nearly 3,000 participants across the world virtually, and, and it is hailed and was hailed as one of the most successful trade shows that we've had. So without leaving their physical location, tourists will be able to create experiences through the use of simulators, handsets, live streaming, and webcams, just to name a few. One uh, emerging consensus is that tourism is likely to look towards the post-COVID era, uh, is something that is going to mean more destinations uh, will increase their share of domestic tourists. That is to say, we begin with domestic tourism. Unfortunately, of course, small destinations like ours are challenged in this regard by sheer numbers. I mean, just inability to drive the level of foreign exchange A that is probably going to be required for us to import so many of the things that are required for the tourism industry. But we have to, in this process, um, develop more effective strategy to sustain high tourism um, occupancy because for us tourism of course is driving demand it expands our market and enables our local production to increase and jobs to be created so the pandemic has then taught us that we must see the tourism sector as being in a crisis mode all the time uh, and therefore requires us to adopt a proactive approach to crisis management that reflects what I call the whole of society approach. To this end, we must uh, pay closer attention to the formulation of standards for vulnerability assessment, risk mapping, and public education campaigns. And you mentioned, um, Elena, the need perhaps for global standardization in this. And part of the concerns that we have is that each country is having its own set of standards, its own set of protocols, it would seem. It's causing so much confusion in trying to just deal with travel in a sustained and seamless way. Um, and one of the things that we need is some global uh, system of standardization. What 
is the intelligence that we must create. What level of surveillance we must have, what detection and information sharing we must have, and what level even of digital uh, technologies we should adopt. So the establishment, for example, of the Global Resilience and Crisis Management Center here in Jamaica, and you mentioned it, Elena, by myself and a number of others, including Talib Refai, um, uh, was established, I think, on the basis to assist in this regard, to, 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 to help for preparedness, management and recovery of disruption and, and crises, and to impact tourism uh, that threaten the livelihood of everyone, and to help to establish standards and also to develop barometers to, to help to measure these um, levels of, of sustainability and resilience so, so that the visitors of the world can understand better where they're going. Investors can also understand how to invest and governments also can plan their resources better. The final comment I want to make on this is that we have established further um, to deal with the global problem, a, a concept called Jamaica Cares. And Jamaica Cares is, is really a groundbreaking travel protection and emergency service program. Uh, the program will provide visitors access to first of its kind traveler protection and emergency medical and crisis management services for events up to and including natural disaster. Uh, these are the kind of innovation I believe that will be proactive uh, in helping to create the sense of a secure destination and travelers are going to want to go to places where they feel that they will be protected and secure. The good news in all of this is that insurance companies are now willing to collaborate with, with tourism in this regard and to ensure that countries, particularly recipient destinations that are small and highly resource challenged, will have an opportunity to manage the, um, the pandemic better and to remove the burden of having healthcare and other crisis management arrangement um, on them for visitors who come to their country, thus displacing locals of some of the critical assets such as beds in hospital, et cetera, et cetera. I think that I've, I've said a lot in this short moment, um, and I think it gives us some sense of where we can go. And um, marketing is important, so is investment in all of these areas. But I believe that the world is now beginning to understand and understand better that this crisis is going to drive a new element of innovation and it is going to pull from man the best that we have because we have to survive Anthropocene Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Your work on tourism resilience and sustainability is very important and we can learn a lot in Europe. Um, as you pointed out, some regions are more dependent uh, of, of tourism than others, and the pandemic impact is uh, far greater yeah. there. I would also like to keep your action in Jamaica to transform uh, the future of tourism with the Tourism Recovery Task Force. I already see that you have a, a complete strategy for the recovery, and it's also important to have a holistic view of the challenges of tourism, climate changes, security threats, and others. And last, you also stressed uh, the importance of the protocol and uh, uh, standards for now and for the future. Very important also, uh, you mentioned the Jamaica CARE. I think we, we learned uh, a lot today from you. So um, let's go to Dr. Mario Hardy, CEO of Pacific Asia Travel Association whom I happen to know also for a very, very long time, um, present, uh, presents an exquisite work, not only in the wider Asia Pacific area, but on a global scale. Since uh, the beginning of the pandemic, Mario has made several interventions. He has organized a series of virtual events, keeping up to date uh, with all latest developments, as well as uh, about uh, cooperating for safer tourism and travel and for how we move forward. Also, Mario shared with us that in Philippines, they have no more uh, uh, COVID cases. Philippines is COVID free. So we would I, like I Mario like to hear your views <laughs> and feedback. Sure. Let, let me just correct you. It's actually in Thailand. In, in, sadly, in the Philippines, they, st they still have many, many cases. 
but here in Thailand, we had since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, 3,866 cases in total. Uh, this is in total since the beginning of the pandemic. This is not daily. Total actually for the, for the entire pandemic. Um, 60 deaths in total um, for, for the current uh, pandemic. And we haven't had any cases for several months already. So a lot of people have been asking the question, why, why is Thailand like this? Why is actually Thailand's been so, um, so much uh, COVID free essentially? And many of the reasons have been explained by Ambassador Doe earlier. Uh, the way we live is very different. The way we greet people obviously is different. We've been wearing masks even before COVID uh, for other reasons, for pollutions and et cetera. So the practice is already there, but it goes beyond this. At the very early stage of the crisis, um, we were actually forced into a complete lockdown for an entire month. The entire country was actually on lockdown for, for a month. Uh, the movement were extremely limited uh, to the, just the bare essentials to go to the grocery and pharmacies and et cetera. Most people work from home uh, almost entirely. Um, and obviously that helped to actually bring down the number of cases. Also, our borders have been completely closed, hermetically closed, no one in, no one out since the beginning of the year. Now, in terms of actually helping with the pandemic, obviously it has a really positive impact. But sadly for the tourism sector, it had an extremely negative impact on the economy. 27% of the GDP here in Thailand is it, it comes directly from tourism. If you count for the indirect, the people making uh, the farmers, the people making crafts in the villages, the people working in the communities, the elephant camps and et cetera, they're severely impacted by, by this current economic crisis that we have at the moment. It is millions and millions of jobs that have actually been lost. I live in a very touristic area of the city of Bangkok. And I can tell you around us, most of the bars and restaurants uh, are actually closed and have been closed for several months already. Most of them, even the signs are completely down, which means no actually the hope of reopening for, for in the future. This recovery for the tourism sector in Thailand will take some time. But what I'd like to focus on is the need for reopening. For most destinations here in Asia, our borders are still closed for the moment. They have been closed for several months with the exceptions of a few corridors uh, just been announced between Singapore and Hong Kong on the 22nd of November. But again, with limited numbers and a few other corridors that actually open between Korea and other countries and Japan and et cetera. For the most part in Southeast Asia countries have remained closed. It is time that we start to think of reopening. It is time that we put the processes in place, the protocols in place for the industry to reopen. For the businesses who work in the private sector, not only here in Thailand, but across Asia, what we wish from our respective governments is to see a plan. We want the government to show us a plan as to when and how they will safely reopen our borders. It's okay if the government come back and says, no, it will reopen in April or in March next year. But as long as we have a plan that we know what are the protocols, the testing that will be required, the type of testing that will be accepted and required, the contact tracing that will be in place, the digital health passport or common pass that will be put in place, which routes and which countries will we reopen with so that the businesses can plan for the future. As you can imagine, if you're a business owner today in November, you would have already in a normal year done your budget for 2021. Most of them can't because there is no plan. We do not know when it will reopen. So it's not only a question of the budget, it's a question of also when do you bring back your employees that you've actually either laid off or put on temporary leave. If you have a plan, they can start to market, they can start to sell, they can start to plan to bring back their staff they can retrain, they can finish all the painting and the refurbishment of their hotels and resort that they might have started during this crisis so that keep, people can actually plan for it. And that's the critical part that is actually missing at the moment. As Gloria mentioned earlier, we can't wait for the vaccine to be distributed globally. It will take years before the entire world is actually vaccinated. 
we need to put the safety protocols in place today so that we can gradually and slowly reopen so that we can each countries and destination can start to recover in their travel and tourism sector. I think that is a priority. And as Minister Bartlett mentioned before, a global coordination is required. We need to ensure that the safety protocols that are put in place are actually similar or accepted in both ends of the trips from the moment you leave at the moment you arrive and vice versa. Because there's a common protocols put in place either within regions or even preferably on a global basis. What type of test is accepted when you board your flight, when you arrive at immigration, to try to make it as simple as possible and as safe as possible for people to restart traveling. We know from the surveys we've been conducting over the last couple of months in China, but also overseas, that there's an immense desire for people to travel. As soon as borders are reopened and it is actually safe, people do want to travel. The desire is there. So we need to give them the means to be able to, to do their travel so we can restart our respective economies. That's the critical part. The last point I'd like to touch upon is how do we make our tourism sector more sustainable, responsible, and more resilient moving forward, as Minister Bartlett mentioned. There's been a lot of discussions over the last couple of months. How do we build a better tourism industry after this current situation? How do we make it more resilient to the future so that when next time we have another crisis of this nature or of any other natures, we're well prepared for it? How do we ensure that it's actually more sustainable, more uh, care more for the environment, care more for the people that actually work in this sector? As I mentioned before, I see it every morning and every evening when I walk to work and come back home the number of now of people who have actually lost their employment just by the fact that the businesses are actually closed around me. What are they doing today to, to help to subsidize for their family, to make sure they have food on the tables every day? We have a very important role as a, in the tourism sector, as I mentioned before. So here in Thailand specifically, it's 27%. But for other countries that are island nations, either in the Caribbean or the Pacific or other places, it is much higher than this. We have islands in the Pacific where their sole revenue is actually tourism, who do not have any, any COVID cases at all, haven't had any at all from the beginning, but their islands are closed because the people coming and visiting their islands are actually from nations that are deeply infected. And they can't reopen because they don't have the medical facilities to treat people coming to their island. Now, imagine if you're someone living on that island whose your livelihood is actually is from the tourists and you have no income for now almost a year and no hope of potential income for probably months to come, if not even longer, if there is no plan presented to them. It is a really difficult situation for the entire sector, but I do believe that if we work together, if we ensure that we have good plans and well-coordinated protocols put in place. We can and we should reopen safely our, and our borders over the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. It is clear that Thailand has done a very good job, but uh, <laughs> uh, with the lockdown, as uh, we can see, they have uh, economic impact uh, that was a disaster. So I am totally understand that we have to have a plan for the reopening uh, protocols, safety uh, protocols. Uh, we have to think about how they will survive the crisis, uh, uh, the workers and the SMEs, and how we're going to open up the borders again. I totally understand your point. I'm sure there are a lot of countries that they will face the same um, issues. Uh, as well after the second lockdown that we have almost uh, in many countries. And now I, I would like to move to our next speaker, Dr. Taleb Rifai, the godfather of the global travel and tourism industry, as we call him. And I have to add also a citizen of the world and a traveler of the world of which we are so proud. 
from his current status and uh, position, but also as a former Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization, his deep knowledge, expertise, and wisdom is an inspiration to all. Allow me on a personal note to express my deep admiration for my friend Taleb, for Dr. Taleb Rifai, his ideas and his valuable work on the field that he's generously uh, shares with us. Taleb? Lena, thank, thank you so much, Elena. I'm, really, I'm truly humbled by what you said. I don't think I deserve all of that, honestly. But I want to point out to something that's very important here. We have three ladies amongst us, and we are three men here. So these ladies, each one of them represents a success story. Gloria Guevara, Madame Do, and your good self. We put all of this together. Gloria had led the DLTC in a very amicable way. And Madame Do, you heard what she said about Korea and the, the success of that. The world should be more having more ladies now to run it. We've seen the success of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Prime Minister of Iceland, Prime Minister of Norway. All of these ladies have provided leadership, it's leadership that we need now. True leadership, that's very important. I want to start by talking about leadership first because each government now is acting on its own. There is no international system that's bringing them together. Elena, you know this from the EU, your good self. We're trying to bring people together. Gloria is trying to bring people together, but it's not working. Not only each government is working on its own, even each district within the government, each city is acting and so on. In Spain here, I'm, I'm in the south of Spain now, Andalusia is acting different from Canary Islands. Canary Islands is acting different from Madrid, and so on and so forth. So this system has to be brought together in a way that it makes some, some coherence. This needs a lot of leadership, and leadership is what we lack nowadays, because people are looking up to the leaders, central leaders, Look what's happening in the United States. I don't need to expand on that. You can see what's happening there. Now, why is all this important? It's important because the industry now is being hit hard, really hit hard. And I, we've heard from Minister Ed Bartlett about Jamaica. Some of the countries are so dependent on international tourism particularly. Although my belief is that the three stages that we need to embark in now. First, we need to live our our industry alive. We need to keep our SMEs particularly and business alive. We need to pump some money, no matter what, even if we borrow the money. It's okay, it's legitimate borrowing. You know that very well from Greece, Minister Elena. So you need to spend money, you need to borrow money, you need to pump money to support these industries, keep them alive. The second stage is to embark on domestic and regional tourism. The third stage is to go into, the, into tourism can't just jump into international directly. It doesn't work that way at all. But having said this, we can understand that countries like Jamaica and many other countries around the world are so de dependent on international tourism. Thailand, for example, is so dependent on international tourism. I know that very well. Some of the small islands like the Maldives, like the Seychelles, like the Mauritius. Island. So what do you do? What you need to do is you know, Jordan, for example, the country that I come from, had zero infections for two weeks. Suddenly, when they opened up, suddenly, we rose up to 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 a day. We're one of the highest rates in the world now because we didn't take care of who's coming in to us. So we need to be very strict on, on how to bring people if we are a COVID-free country. And we need to do that very, very carefully, very amicably. To keep closing it is not the answer. Mario, I'm sure you know this. I'm sure you agree with me. But we need to put in place some procedures, like testing. I think Korea has done it correctly. Testing, tracing, and treatment. The vaccine is not going to be the solution at all. Vaccines will take time. Even if people have vaccine, that's no guarantee. Vaccine is an immunity booster only. Nothing more. I personally am not going to be vaccinated. I don't believe in vaccines. I'm sure many people don't. But to keep waiting for the vaccine as a vaccine is a solution. It's not a solution. The solution is leadership. You need to make sure that countries are clear in what they demand from anybody that comes there. 
testing is very important. You have to test very quickly, very cheaply, and get results quickly in everywhere we can. That's the that's where the energy must be put. I believe in that completely. Now, after that, what we need to do is to do the following four four points. I think we worked out in Africa. I'm a member of the African Tourism Board, and it's working very well in Africa because Africa is one of the continents that's not yet very much damaged by COVID. It can be if it doesn't open up. Opening up must be very careful, Elena. So what we need to do now is four points. Point number one is emphasize domestic and regional tourism. By, by domestic, we know what it is. Domestic tourism is, is tra people travel inside their countries. I say this and I keep saying it. This is an opportunity. It's not just a must. Because I believe in principle that a country I, I keep saying this, a country is not visited and enjoyed by its people, cannot be enjoyed by anybody else outside of the country. It's a matter of principle, we should have done this before even, way before COVID, but COVID has opened our eyes on it. Now, if the country is too small to get in any domestic tourism, to keep it alive, because I know the limitations of domestic tourism. Domestic tourism does not bring in hard currency, it does not boost the travel of trade, travel of trade but it keeps businesses alive and keeps facilities alive. If you don't have the numbers, then you have to depend on regional tourism, open corridors and bubbles, like many countries are doing. The third stage is international tourism. In this regard, I'd like to promote a concept that has developed big, the concept of digital nomads. This concept can guarantee some international visitors, long stays, in other words, instead of having one, 10 people come and stay for oh, one yeah. day in a country I think what you need to do is have one person stay for 10 days. The digital nomads now is a need because everybody's working from home. Thailand, Canaries, uh, Maldives, Jamaica can start attracting people from all over the world. They can scream as much as they can. They can stay for a month or two or three, not just a day, two or three, to work from there. What you need is a good ne network of internet to be able to to move forward. That's what I think should be the beginning of international to tourism. Long stay. Hotels must start preparing pack packages for longer stays. So of having packages for a day or two, you must have a package for a week or a month or two, and so on and so forth. That's what I want to say for the moment. Once again, thank you so much, Elin, for taking this upon yourself. I know the EU is a very, very important uh, organization for us, and you're in the right place in the right place. I've always admired you very much. You know this. I'm not trying to return any compliments here. But you've been very active. And I'm sure that the EU and tourism in the EU will see a new page under your leadership. Thank you so much, Elena, once again. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to you, Dr. Talib Rifai, for this valuable contribution. You stress out the disasters, uh, the disastrous results of the lack of leadership globally. The same is true even on a national or regional level. You stress out the need uh, for um, um, for keeping uh, the sector alive. Uh, spend money to keep the sector alive. Also, you uh, mentioned that domestic tourism needs to have a boost. Um, and also testing and tracing. Um, I think we have um, many uh, talking points right now um, to, to talk about. And as we have uh, concluded the first round, I would like um, to, to ask you for your comments and uh, maybe to talk a little bit about uh, the critical issues that uh, we brought up. I would like to start with uh, His Excellency uh, Edmund Bartlett. We have like uh, four or five minutes for the statement. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Talib is one of my inspirations in, in this industry, and I've learned so much from him, and I really want to pay tribute to the leadership that he's given. And the four points that he's 
is made is, is very critical. And I think I, domestic tourism as, as one of the key areas of recovery is critical. Um, and a lot of countries, particularly the larger ones, will find favor with this um, to a greater extent, um, as he indicated, than some of us, the smaller territories where we have economy of scale to deal with. We have also critical mass issues to deal with. And also that because of foreign exchange, is so heavily dependent on tourism flows from international visitors. Unless we are able to get international visitors coming in, we're going to be seriously constrained in terms of any economic recovery program at all. But the, the point is well taken that the, the need for us to start with appreciation of ourselves and for the local people to be utilizing the tourism assets that are available in their place is to keep jobs, it's to really keep at least the, the, the facilities uh, open and, and utilized. So, so I do totally agree with that. The issue of international standards is critical. And I make the point against the background with you that um, we are very uh, confused, it seems, on even the question of testing and pre-testing. Because the, 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 the medical response, the clinical response in, in Jamaica, for example, is that testing is of a lesser value than quarantining or social distances or any of the, the five key touch points that have been established globally. Um, whilst testing is a cost, um, it does not in their mind uh, indicate properly uh, what the status of the, 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 the visitor really is. Um, Barbados has an example where uh, a small ship came in and everybody tested negative all the way. And by the time they left Barbados, you had six of them that were positive. And then it became an issue that perhaps we got it from Barbados, when in fact it perhaps um, was a case where they were in fact um, uh, positive, but not detected at the time when the tests were done. So there are these issues. but. The point, however, is for us to have a common understanding somewhere and an institution has to be set up, an entity that deals with looking at all of these issues and uh, fine tuning to determine what are truly the best practices and what's the mix of clinical solution and physical arrangements, as well as psychosocial responses. So the Global Resilience and Crisis Management Center, Talib, that you helped me to put together, I believe is well-placed to, to offer this kind of um, support. Uh, we have already established a satellite uh, center in um, Nairobi at the Kenyatta University, which was just inaugurated a few days ago. We had a professor named for the first time, and the, the center is now fully operational in Kenya. Um, and I think that we need to look beyond that now to see how many more such centers can be established. And finally, I think that investment now is the big argument. And how do we get the banks and the international institutions to recognize that there is a huge credit problem that is going to be developing, indeed has developed in the tourism industry. In Jamaica here, for example, our exposure in tourism is some 56 billion US. I'm sorry, not US, Jamaican, which is probably just um, a little under a um, billion and a half or so US. Now that's huge for any small economy to deal with. How do we create some kind of a, um, of a, a, a national index to deal with that? How do we get a combination of banking and government resources to establish a, a special unit, a special entity that is going to respond to perhaps buying out that debt, restructuring it, and enable the industry to take off. So I think that this area, and it's going to be for the big financiers to consider, how is it that we are going to enable a financial operation to create an opportunity for recovery and, um, and for, for our tourism entities to remain um, economically viable, indeed to have a cash flow to recover. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, I think you are an example for uh, a lot of uh, uh, ministers, uh, the way you really uh, see uh, the restart of tourism and the strategy you have. 
And um, I would like to uh, ask Ambassador Do uh, to make uh, her statement. Am I on? Yes, yes. You mean, okay, I don't see the screen, but that's fine. We can uh, see you and we can hear you very well. Okay, very good, very good. I think uh, Dr. Rifai, uh, as he said, uh, domestic tourism could be, you know, uh, interim answer to this crisis, how these people, uh, you know, unemployed, they can make their, you know, earn their uh, bread every day. And yes, we are looking at, in case of Korea, we're looking at uh, domestic tourism very, very seriously. And I think government is actually subsidizing certain part of um, uh, companies uh, uh, operation. And then we are now looking for looking at uh, regional tourism. But the issue is this, when we trying to from domestic to regional, immediately, this 14 days of quarantine becomes an issue. Like for instance, like next year, 2021, Tokyo uh, Summer Olympics is going to be held in the summer in July. And for us to go to Japan or Tokyo, it takes only two and a half hours flight. And we attend, we come back and we have to be um, uh, quarantined for 14 days whether you are, you know, even if you have a negative result of testing, you are 14 days. It, this is the biggest issue in Korea for many hotels. You know, the, all these five-star hotels, like their occupancy is like 24, 25%. They can't do it with the 24, 25%. But then they're asking uh, government, please, is there any way you can uh, ease this quarantine date? But, you know, I'm not a bureaucrat, you're a politician, but bureaucrats, who in the world will be, say, okay, and I'll be responsible, yes, no quarantine, or seven days, this is, this, no one will take chance because this situation with the, this corona-19 is also, we don't know anything about this in a virus. So we are all victim. So we are going to promote domestic tourism. Government is even going to give some coupons and for people, and if you make reservation, we give certain discount. We're going to really encourage people travel domestically first. But here's a caveat too. You have to keep social distance. And as of yesterday, if you don't uh, wear the mask, in a place you right. must wear the mask, you are fined $100. So these things are happening right now. So I see in Korea's case, domestic uh, uh, tourism, we would love to enlarge the regional tourism because there are events coming up, but then 14 days quarantine. So how could we, the worldwide, we could work together internationally who the, come up with a wise solution not putting 14 days of quarantine. Thank you. Uh, well, I totally understand because uh, what we said before is like we have to uh, coordinate the protocols and the measures uh, and uh, this has to be globally. Otherwise, the restart is not going to be that easy. Um, Let's uh, move now and I give the floor to um, uh, Dr. Mario Hardy. Mario, can you hear us? Yes, sorry. I was trying to put myself on unmute. Thank you, Elena, uh, for the opportunity to, to uh, brief you again. I've got three points I want to touch. Two that have actually already been mentioned by uh, Dr. Rifai and, and uh, Ambassador Do about domestic tourism. And here in Thailand, domestic tourism, the moment that the, the lockdown was actually stopped uh, at the end of March, um, domestic tourism numbers picked up really rapidly. It was so much to a point where actually it was nearly impossible to uh, book a, a weekend away uh, outside the city of Bangkok. It was initially mostly for a driving distance, no flying. Um, now actually domestic flights are operating uh, and domestic tourism is going very strong. 
And I hope, as Dr. Rifai mentioned, that we can continue this culture of domestic tourism moving forward post COVID-19. Uh, but obviously it is not enough, uh, certainly for the, for the contribution that tourism is bringing to the country, the international visitors are really critical to keep the businesses that were in operations or reopen some businesses. We do need international tourism and we'll need them moving forward. But domestic tourism, I think is something that we should continue to encourage uh, for reasons that, uh, doc, uh, that uh, Minister Bartlett mentioned before, to become more resilient. But next time we have another crisis, if we already have a good base of domestic tourism, at least we're not down to zero again. We have some level of tourism actually happening within our respective destination. So I think this is a critical part that we need to continue to focus, re reinforce, and have also as we do for international tourism uh, marketing campaigns, market ourselves internally, domestically, uh, to get our own citizens and residents to travel in our respective destination. The second point I want to, to bring on is um, a very briefly that uh, Dr. Rifai mentioned about digital nomads. And I guess to a certain degree, he is a digital nomad because he's roaming between Jordan and Spain and other places. And uh, in a few months time, I will become also a digital nomad working, I don't know from where. Um, the nature of businesses now, because of COVID-19, have suddenly realized that actually having fixed offices and having all of your employees working in a single office is, may not actually be necessary for the future. It is okay for people to work remotely. Um, in some cases, certainly in our cases, we found that actually our employees are much more productive this way. Um, less time to commute, uh, working from home, uh, more dedicated. They end up working much longer hours than if they're actually at the office itself. Uh, so I think it's a win-win for everybody. But it also means that they don't have to be in Bangkok. They can work in Chiang Mai or they can work in another country if they want to. Um, so I think there's certainly something in, in this area where digital nomads will become something quite important moving forward where people will be able to work remotely from different destinations. However, I think what happened initially, there were a few islands in, in the Caribbean who opened up to digital nomads and did some really good PR and marketing about it. And you have people who have been digital nomads now already for a number of years, they're experienced at it. They know all the tricks and all the complications of being a digital nomad. But now with this new opening, you end up with a large number of people who are, do not know all the intricacies of becoming a digital nomad. It's actually complicated the visa requirements, uh, your taxes in your respective countries are also at your destinations, the, the tax implications, um, and so many other aspects of life that actually becomes more complicated of managing either your property remotely, your expenses, and et cetera. So I think you know, when countries think about opening up for long-term stays for people to be digital nomad, they also need to think more carefully about the services they need to provide to them to ensure um, that their medical care is covered and the insurance and everything else that actually is needed to make it a little bit easier to welcome digital nomads to stay in your country for extensive period of time, uh, which is actually good for, for them as, as equally as good for your destination. And finally, one last point I want to touch upon, which we haven't talked about today, is the one thing that actually we've seen throughout this crisis is the exponential acceleration of the development of technologies. Many technologies that we were in discussion before COVID-19, we were expecting them in maybe five to 10 years from now. Now they're here. We're actually using them almost on a daily basis. And some are about to actually come into our life much, rapid, much more rapidly than we expected before. Uh, touchless check-in at hotels and airports, uh, to immigrations, uh, to digital payment is increasing. I read an article uh, just a few days ago, which was fascinating, is that, believe it or not, in Norway, only 4%, 4% of all transactions are done with cash, paper money, only 4%, which means 96% of all the business transactions are done digitally at the moment. Now, that's one country which is far ahead of any others but many other destinations are moving in that direction too. We're talking about other technologies that we saw maybe expecting in 10 to 20 years, drone deliveries, air, uh, drone air taxis with driverless, 
driverless cars are actually coming much faster than we expected before. And I mentioned them because I think as, as tourism, as a tourism industry, we need to pay attention to these technologies because they will impact jobs, they will impact actually our businesses, and they will impact the way we travel in the future also. So I'll leave it there for the moment, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mario Hardy. I will keep uh, uh, in mind, and this is a very interesting topic about the technologies, as you mentioned. Um, they came very fast, they will stay, uh, and uh, I'm not very sure, though, if uh, the workers appreciate to work so many hours from home, because to be honest, uh, since uh, home working started, we work many, many hours. Much more. <laughs> but it's true, it's true that the digital uh, technologies, they came fast and they will stay. So, uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. The issue of digital nomads means you don't have to work from home. You can work from any home you want around the world. The world is open up for you. So you can go and work by the seaside like I'm doing now. I'm in Marbella, south of Spain. I'm doing work here. I'm a digital nomad, as Mario said. <laughs> and this is, this is something that is very, very important. Now I want to talk about four things, please. First, domestic tourism and the importance of it. Travel all together and digital nomads is part of international travel. It's not, just, it's not just coming to work here, it's coming to relax. Long stays are becoming more important than short stays. For example, at the Dead Sea in Jordan, you could come and relax in the most healthy place in the world, where oxygen is at maximum, lowest spot in the world. You could get medical wellness and work at the same time. So the important thing is long stay, not the purpose of your stay. The important thing is that hotels and tour operators should start catering now for the thinking in a different way. You should start thinking of long-term stays, a month or two, not just a day or two or a week or something like that. But the other thing is technology. Technology now is becoming very important, digital technology. It's going faster. It's not just going to be about working at distance and meeting like we are meeting now digitally. We wish we were together hugging and kissing. I know that, Elena. That's very, very important for us to meet face to face. But nowadays, even personal events are going to be conducted digitally. You know, we have seen Pocelli, for example, from Leon, from Italy. We are enjoying some of the things that we used to enjoy in crowds alone at home, whatever home is. Home, the concept of home has changed completely now. Now, why is this important? Because it will move from the issue of being simply for meetings and big gatherings into personal occasions. I had my daughter getting married last month digitally. Me and the father of the groom were sitting in Amman. She was with her husband in Dubai and the priest was on the third line. And we got them married there. Of course, it's not like being together, hugging her and wishing her the best. She's missing a lot, but we have to do something sometime, even on a personal level. Birthdays and parties are being held digitally now. So the concept of digital technology is going to move more and more. Now, the third point here, safety and security. It's very important to have a peace of mind when you travel. That's why I think Jamaica Cares program that Edmund has talked about is very important because it, it puts your mind at peace. Now, people are ready to travel as they are. But they will not travel because the government told them to travel. They will travel when they feel safe. They will only feel safe if insurance companies come to, together with us and draft a compact, co a coordinated scheme that would ensure that everybody that travels is, is secure. You know that you have a hospital to go to if something goes wrong. You have a, a plane to take you back home if you need to. Insurance companies must grab this opportunity as well to draft new contracts. And we need to do this on an on on a global level. Now, checking about global. Now, again, it's, I want to go back to leadership once again, because now Madame Do talked about testing and, and difference between testing and quarantine. I don't think quarantine should be an option for us. Quarantine is not a guarantee for anything. Testing is, we should improve testing. We should put our energy in improving testing so that testing becomes 
99% accurate, becomes fast and becomes inexpensive. You test before leaving a place, test before going to an airplane, test when you arrive. If you test negative, it's fine. If you test positive, we treat it in a different way. These regulations must be international regulations. We need new leadership to do that. We're not having the right leadership to enforce this. Every country is having quarantines as, as it wants. In the UK, you go there still to stay for two weeks in a home. I came to Spain here. All that I had to do is test before coming, show them that I tested 72 hours before and sign a paper that said if, if I test positive or if I have any symptoms that I have to stay at home. We have to trust each other, like Koreans are doing. You know, Korea is a very good example of, of this because people and government are working together. I learned in Korea, for example, even before COVID, that you don't enter any home unless you take up your shoes. Now my entrance to my home here in Marbella is full of shoes outside of, of the home. It's become the normal. It's not just an exception. Wearing a mask there is normal. In winter, everybody wears a mask for pollution, for the flu, for anything silly. You wear a mask. Social distance is the only big problem that we have now because we're not enjoying each other's gathering. But we could if we have more space. If we have more space to breathe, it's going to be an opportunity for us now to go to places that are not so crowded. So the issue of over-tourism will be over by now. I hope. So what I wanted to say. We have three very important issues. One is domestic tourism, two is tourism, and three is safety and security. All of this needs a fourth element, which is training and retraining. Our staff have to be trained and retrained now. There's a new norm now. A hotel reception desk must be trained again. Now you cannot have the same way of dealing with your customers. You have to know how to take your money, how to take a credit card, how to smile, what to say. Cleaner in a hotel has to be trained in a different way. Cleaner of an airplane has to be trained in a different way. A bellboy that receives somebody at the door of the hotel has to be retrained. How to carry the luggage, how to go up to your room. All of these little things need a massive program of national training and retraining. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Taleb Rifai. I would like to keep in mind a few things like uh, safety and security. The three T was great, like uh, test, uh, yes. trace, and, uh, trace and treatment. And treatment. I would like also to treatment, keep uh, treatment the little is different. I mean, treatment is different from vaccine. Of course. No. Of course. Treatment, treatment is treatment. Of course, yeah. treatment is treatment. Exactly. The vaccine, as uh, everybody mentioned, uh, will take uh, longer, and we'll see how safe it is, and hopefully. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, make a little statement here that everybody talked about the leadership that has to be there with the responsibility and uh, protocols, uh, common protocols, yes. uh, how we travel. Um, of course, uh, internationally. Internationally, exactly. So we all agree that more cooperation, common approaches and responses are more effective than unilateral efforts uh, in dealing with this crisis and for the benefits uh, of all. So once again, I would like to thank you, all of you, for your valuable insight, for making this webinar informative and productive and for all your great comments. I look forward to working further with all of you for several issues and proposals and were brought up today. And we share the same goal for making travel and tourism strong again beyond this crisis and for the benefit of all. So um, thank you. We will return tomorrow with our second webinar and uh, the remarkable speakers focusing or restarting travel and tourism in Europe and talk more about a topic that we mentioned today about the support of uh, the workers, the support uh, of the SMEs to survive. So the next day after the pandemic to find the travel and tourism uh, sector much stronger. Thank you so much all of you for joining us today.
Thank you. Goodbye, and then thank you're you. great. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, all the ladies Bye. in the world. Thank you.